Yeah, everybody shy is completely the opposite of Pedro's lab. So, but if they want to say hi. <laughs> you, ah, Pedro, Emily, open, Emily's here. Open your microphone. Yeah. Emily, Emily's from Kansas. And Riham is from Saudi Arabia. And you know Rodrigo. Rodrigo is this guy. He's from Brazil too. <laughs> Um, okay, so I think we can start. So I'll introduce uh, Dr. Garrett. It's a pleasure to introduce him. Um, briefly, he ha has a major in chemistry that he got in Swarthmore College, Pennsylvania in 1985. He, got, he did his PhD at Caltech with Barbara Wode studying transcriptional control in the mouse immune system. He did his postdoc at University of California with Larry Zipersky, where he studied exon guidance in flies. And then he worked as a professor at MIT. He joined MIT in 1998. And then he moved to Grande. I don't know if I say saying it right, Bronze's University in 2006. But I, um, because I know that, um, uh, I just, it's just a short history about thermal stress in Drosophila just to place him in the field. So the story about therm thermal stress studies in Drosophila is happening since the 1920s. In 1996, the first gene involved in perception of temperature was described uh, by Syed and Benzer. Uh, in 2003, look, many, many decades has passed. Daniel Trace Jr. and Benzer, again, describes, they describe another gene involved in temperature perception called painless. In 2003, there is, um, in a nature paper, um, Viswa Nath and Jegla shows how the TRPA1 that was already a non-temperature receptor in mammals, uh, they showed how it worked in Drosophila, but using Sanopus oocytes. And then in 2005, Paul Garrity and his student Mark Hosenzweig describes in vivo and shows in vivo in Drosophila larva that this trip A1 regulates thermotaxis. And after that, after this 2005 paper, he published, ha, has been, he's publishing a lot of papers about how Drosophila perceives external temperatures. And nowadays he's one of the most important researchers studying temperature sensing in Drosophila. So I think now you can continue from here, Paul. Oh, thank you, Anna, for that very kind and nice introduction. I'm going to try to share my screen here uh, and let's see how well I do. Okay, so let us see here. I hope that you can all see my screen. I'm going to try to go into presenter mode here. Go ahead. And tell That's me fine. it works, right? Excellent. So now I'm going to try to go to whole screen. Did I succeed? Perfect. Yes. You can all see it. Awesome. Thank you, Anna, for the invitation. And thank you to everyone here. I apologize for being late. Uh, I was teaching. Uh, until a couple of minutes ago. So luckily I wasn't doing much today because Michael Rossbash, my next door neighbor, uh, we were doing circadian rhythms and it seemed ridiculous for me to give a lecture on that when Michael discovered, you know, cloned the per gene and did all that kind of stuff. So he gave my class. So what I'm gonna tell you about today is a bit what Anna was telling you about. And I'll tell you about some, I'll start with the classic stuff and then I'll move into more recent work. And actually uh, a lot of my lab now does vector mosquitoes and does host seeking behavior in those animals. So hopefully people will, um, I would encourage everybody to ask questions and stop me. Uh, I will do my best to uh, 
not go on too long. Uh, I have lots of different stuff to talk about, but uh, please feel free to always uh, raise your hand. Uh, Anna, if you could keep an eye on the chat, because I might not be keeping an eye on the chat. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Would be good. I will take care of it. Awesome. Okay. So let me get started. Let's see here. Okay. So temperature, as I think you all know, is uh, essentially a universal phys phys physical variable, right? Anywhere there's matter, there is temperature. So it's ubiquitous, right? And so that always fascinated me because it controls everything. As an undergrad, I was fascinated by thermodynamics, right? Which is really the critical driving force behind chemistry, right? And so what you know from thermodynamics is that basically temperature affects the rate and the direction of every chemical reaction. And that of course means that temperature is one of the most important parameters for life, right? Because it, it controls all aspects of physiology. It's working on temperature really important, but also incredibly difficult because everything responds to temperature. So how do you go about teasing it apart when every time you start manipulating the system, it responds, right? It's a bit different than working on a chemical. That it's very difficult to look at it because temperature is everywhere, right? Every atom responds to temperature. And so not surprisingly, given that it's that important, um, we and probably most of the other animals that I know of on this planet have really sophisticated thermosensory systems. And so, you know, we have noxious thermosensory systems. Those are the kind that are involved in, you know, taking your hand off of a hot stove, for example. And that was really the work, the painless work, for example, was, it, was looking at what genes do you need for a fly to roll away from a hot probe? So the receptors, the, the pathways that I'm gonna be talking about though today are very different from those. Those are the ones that are involved in body temperature control. And it's interesting because we're really aware of all of the, you know, sensing hot temperatures and it, oh, it's painful. But we constantly have working inside of us thermoreceptors that are always tuning our body temperature so that we can survive. And we're not even aware of it. And these innocuous thermosensory systems are the ones that my lab has been working on now for about 15 years. And I'm really fascinated by how they work to control and rate our body temperatures. So, and, and the body temperatures of insects so that they're able to survive. Now, it also turns out that these sensory mechanisms for sensing innocuous temperature are also really important for host seeking. Now, you know, pit vipers use heat to find warm, you know, find a warm mouse to, to attack and eat. And mosquitoes or, or assassin bugs, they use heat to try you, right? So that they can lay eggs on you, inject you with parasites, et cetera, right? So these are really important sensory modalities. And so what I'm gonna be talking about today are these kinds of innocuous thermosensory systems. So what Anna suggested was that you might be interested in kind of the history of how we got involved or how I got involved in it. And as Anna mentioned, Androsophila, since my postdoc, and I started my lab at MIT to really think about how um, axons in the nervous system wires itself up. But in fact, the students out there, this is a really good example about how you sort of take what life gives you and you figure out what to do. I was incredible as a PI. Pretty sure I, I failed to make really important discoveries for a few years and it was pretty clear that things were really tough. And so what I thought about was what I really wanted to do was to go work on there's no literature, an important problem that nobody was looking at. And at the time there was only one paper that had actually been published on Drosophila thermoregulation, the Saeed and Benzer paper. And so I thought, you know, that's an important question. Nobody's working on it. What have I got to lose? And so essentially, I just decided that I was gonna completely shift my lab from working on developmental biology to working on behavior. And so it was that temp flies would be a really great place to look at temperature regulation because essentially their body temperatures are about so it's really easy to control their body temperature. It's the temperature of their surroundings and the body temperature changes. Unlike us, where it's really hard to change our body temperatures, right? And the other thing is that it's really easy to interrogate what's going on. So in flies, you know, we use behavior. 
it's very easy to get a readout for what's going on with the animal based on how they move. And the beautiful part about flies is that they're so small that the main way they thermoregulate is moving around. And what that means is that rather than like in a mouse where thermoregulation is very complicated or in me where it's very complicated, I sweat, I overheat, I have all this stuff going on. In a fly, you can just watch it move around and you have a sense about what its thermoregulatory behavior is, okay? So that makes it a really powerful and easy system to study this question. And for whatever reason, so as, as Anna mentioned, the real first work that I had seen on this was actually at a joint group meeting with Seymour Benzer's lab. So this was back in 1996 when I was a postdoc in Larry Zapersky's lab. So Larry had been a postdoc with Seymour and we had joint group meeting. And I was sitting there and watching this guy present the stuff. And I honestly have to tell you that I had no idea in my life that I would spend most of my career working on this stuff. I thought he was studying behavior. Behavior was just too artsy fartsy for me. I was gonna work on wiring. But in the end, it turned out that what Omar did is basically what my whole career has been based on, or at least a chunk of my career. So what Omar found was that if you put flies on a thermal gradient, gradient of temperatures, they act just like about every other animal on the planet. They pick a particular temperature that they want to be at that's best for their body temperature, right? Where their body works best. And so, um, you know, that's essentially what they did was they put flies on a gradient of temperatures. Go ahead. Is there a question? No, okay. Probably just, um, okay. Uh, and so what they found was that if they put flies on a gradient and left them there for 20 minutes or so, most of them would accumulate around 24, which is the temperature that a fly likes. Now, what was not known at this point was what were the molecules, what were the circuits? There were basically, there was this paper and then no follow-up. Actually, the first author went on to become a consultant, right? Project was dropped, that was it. And so I had a graduate student, Mark Rosenzweig, who was really interested in trying to do something creative. We had been doing RNAi screens for developmental mutants. So we just decided, well, why don't we just start injecting embryos with double-stranded RNA and watching how they thermotax on gradients. So what we were doing initially was actually injecting animals by hand with pieces of double-stranded RNA, targeting different genes, and then actually looking at the behavior of the animals we had injected. And by doing that, we came across what are called TRIP-A1 that seemed to be really important for the behavior. What we found, and this was uh, over a course of several years, we eventually made mutants, whereas wild-type flies liked around 25 or 26 degrees, knockouts for TRIP-A1 would go into these warm regions and they would just stay there. They would be able to distinguish really warm from regular temperatures, okay? And that was the first clue that we had really hooked into something that was really important for thermosensing in the fly. Now, as Anna mentioned, TRIP-A1 had recently been shown uh, by um, Vina and actually uh, in, 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 in a paper in Nature that the fly TRIP-A1 was a warmth activated cation channel. This was actually for a, for a social part of it. This was the other reason why I started working on temperature. The last author on this article was a guy named Ardem Patapudian, who was my graduate student buddy from Barbara Wold's lab at Caltech. He cloned the mouse trip A1 and said, hey, flies have a trip A1. Is anybody working on temperature sensing? And I thought, nobody but me. So we started collaborating. And that's really how I started really getting into trip A1 and how it was controlling the behavior. Now, this gave us our sort of first view of thermal preference in flies. What we thought, and this is gonna be kind of a theme today is I'm gonna tell you about all the things we thought, how we were totally wrong and how that was perfectly fine, okay? So what we thought was that there are these neurons in the brain that we discovered called AC neurons, which are located actually inside the fly's head. They make this heat receptor. And when the temperature rises above about 25, those neurons fire, okay? And what we thought was that what this was doing was basically just acting like a fire alarm, right? Whenever the fly got too hot, these neurons would get excited and then the fly would run back to wherever it took to make the thing shut up. Basically like an alarm clock, right? You're trying to shut it off. Now, so this was our first view, but it didn't take very long for us to realize that this was probably not the whole story. What happened was we had been originally using the gradient that Benzer had used, which was a very shallow thermal gradient, okay? 
what we realized was that if you put flies on exactly the same range of temperatures, but you made the gradient tenfold steeper, very steep, rather than taking 20 minutes for the fly to decide what to do, the fly would figure out that it was placed and get somewhere else. It turned out that trip A1, that receptor, was required to knock it out. The animals couldn't do this, but they could do this steeper gradient task, even though the temperature ranges we were using were utterly identical. And it turned out that there was a second receptor we discovered called GR28, which was actually called GR because it actually is a taste receptor. Well, it's actually related to it's not a taste receptor. What we found was that the flies actually have two different pathways sensing the exact same temperatures, and but they drive different behaviors. So the, the thing about it was that rather than being one of those trick channels, it's actually most of these receptors are ligand gated ion channels, like the fly's heat receptor or bitter, all these seven trains that act channels. We found that one of these was actually not a, a taste receptor, but actually would act like a warmth activated ion channel if you put it in OSI. So it was a trip receptor, just like a trip protein, only it's completely unrelated to it. Okay, so what did this give us the sense? So what we realized initially then was that flies were much more complicated than we had thought. So we had thought that they were just like these little point sources that would have maybe one thermoreceptor that would tell them where they are. But that was totally wrong. It turned out that they had at least two different pathways. One that was actually in neurons that were located at the periphery that would drive responses to steep gradients. And then they had another set of neurons that were activated by the exact same temperatures, but were actually inside the brain. And I like to think of them like a meat thermometer. So like when the, when the meat of the head is heating up, these trip A1 cells get excited and then the fly eventually avoids that area, okay? So now what this is beginning to give us a sense of is that the, the pathways for temperature in the fly, even though it's a cold-blooded little animal, are pretty sophisticated. The other idea is that it gave us a sense about the initial kind of logic of warmth detection, which is basically that you have different systems on the outside and the inside. So you've got these peripheral receptors that are letting the animal sense the environmental temperature, kind of giving it a clue about which way things are moving, right? which direction temperature is changing. And then it uses that to guide behavior. But if you wait long enough and the fly actually itself begins to heat up, these internal sensors will kick in as like a second sort of backstop so that the fly doesn't actually overheat and die, okay? All right, so that's great. Now, hi. Yeah, go ahead. So, my question. How, how, how you know that they are internal sensors? So they, 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 if, if they will have an internal sensor, it should be, it, should, it depends on heart beating or something on the hemolymph fluxes or? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, we know it's internal because it's embedded inside the brain. So it doesn't have contact to the surface. Sorry, I took a lot of this out because I didn't want to, but good question. But it's actually, that was a super surprise for us. We thought trip A1 was going to be in the antenna, right? But actually it's like inside the brain, which is pretty interesting, right? So it probably is sensing like hemolymph temperature or something, which is really pretty cool. Okay, so this kind of idea where we've got these hot receptors made us think that there must also be cold receptors, right? Because the fly ends up at 25. And so we had this model that there were going to be hot receptors that drove the fly away from really high temperature and that there would be cold receptors that would sense cold. And then what you'd end up with is you'd end up with the flies at 25 degrees because they would be unhappy over here, they'd be unhappy over here, but here they'd be sort of minimally unhappy. Now, the basic idea for this turned out to be wrong. And the reason why that was wrong is that actually, when we looked, we wanted to ask, are these neurons that we're calling hot and cold receptors, do they really respond to hot and cold? No one, we had been all, everyone in the field had been using steam imaging with amps of sine waves of temperature. And it turns out that's a very poor way to distinguish how a thermoreceptor responds to temperature. So what we decided to do was to actually do electrophysiology, really detailed analysis how these thermoreceptors respond to temperature. Now, the receptors, some of the flow 
receptors are actually in this little thing that sometimes people that are not familiar with flies call it the antenna, but it's called the arista. It's a little piece of cuticle that sticks out of the antenna. And it has only six neurons inside of it. It's got three cooling active cold cells, cells. All it's got inside of it are thermoreceptors. So this little thing that you see, basically a thermosensitive organ, okay? And I suspect it's black because it's probably really good at picking up on light. So light comes in, heats it up, and the fly runs away. Now, what Gonzalo Budelli, a postdoc in my lab from Uruguay, he's actually gonna be going by this faculty position there. He decided to do electrophysiology from the arista and ask, what are these neurons really, how do they really respond to nature? And what he discovered was actually very surprising to us. What he found was that these neurons that everyone in the field had been calling cold receptors don't respond to cold. They actually respond to the, the change of temperature, not actually the absolute value. What that means is that what you're looking at here is the spike rate, okay? And so this is, for example, a fly being held at 30 degrees. And then what happens is we're dropping the temperature to 25 and holding it at 25. So it's colder over here than it is here. If you look at the spike rate, what you see is that while the temperature is changing, the neuron fires like crazy, and then it immediately adapts and goes back down to baseline. So even though it's colder over here, the neurons firing less, okay? And the other thing is that the temperature of the fly isn't there yet, older. It really means that this is not colder. This is actually a derivative sensor, a cooling receptor. And so the, basically if you, this is just kind of summarizing a lot of data see is that the way these neurons act is that if you hold them at temperature, they have a baseline firing rate. While the temperature is dropping, they fire like crazy. And then they adapt to the old firing rate. But then if you heat them back up, they go completely silent. And then they recover again. Now, what this means is that they respond to temperature change. Even though we're calling it a cooling cell, it basically can report on both cooling and heating. It just causes opposite chain, you know, opposite um, responses. We also re respond recorded from the heating cells, the hot cells, and we find they act just like the cooling cells, but in the opposite direction. So what we've got are not hot and cold receptors, but are receptors for heating and cooling, right? These guys are just informing the fly, is it getting better? Is it getting worse? It's not making any statement about is it hot or is it cold? Uh, All right. Hi, Paul. May I have a question? Of course. This this uh, this uh, pattern is very interesting. So I was wondering whether whether this pattern of cooling cells when the when the flies are in a lower temperature and the opposite trend when uh, they heat up mm -hmm. are linked to metabolism as a way because of the uh, activation of the neurons will be acting as a mechanism to generate heat because of ATP requiring mechanisms to activate the neurons. So is that a relationship on, on, on in this sense? So my suspicion is, is that that is probably true for internal neurons that we were unable to record from yet. These neurons are extremely peripheral. And so I think the thin extensions that stick out from the fly so I think that they very, very quickly equilibrate to ambient temperature. So I, I bet you that there's metabolic stuff going on deeply that probably, you know, in the viscera that are probably doing that. But these particular neurons that we're not, that we're looking at here do not show that. Although what I should tell you is while I'm not explaining it here, these neurons respond to five millisecond changes in temperature. Okay, that's basically, as strong as a snake thermoreceptor, right? That's one in a thousand, right? One part in a thousand of temperature change. So they're incredibly thermosensitive. That's probably why they have to do this adaptation because if they didn't, they would just saturate, right? So they could totally respond to the kind of thing that you're raising, but they would have to be internal to do that probably, okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. You bet, thank you for the question. Again, I love questions and uh, that'd be great.
Um, so what are the molecules? All right, so GR28 turns out to be the heating receptor. And I, I can talk about that later if you're curious, but it is. For the cooling receptor, the problem was that from Charles Zucker's lab in 2011 that had proposed three trip channels as cold receptors or cooling receptors in these, in these cooling cells. So immediately, of course, we looked at these mutants and there was a problem, which is that all the Brevito mutants responded to temperature indistinguishably from wild type. They had no defect. So they had nothing to do with cold detection or cooling detection. So that left us with what were the actual molecules? If it's not the Brevitos, what's doing it? And so for that, what we did was we started looking at other receptors. And in fact, just as a historical thing, I actually discovered this, discovered this, while my son was doing piano lessons, I was actually Googling uh, molecules expressed in the Arista. And I happened to come across uh, something from a Richard Benton paper where he had described this molecule called IR21A that was for some reason expressed in the Arista. So I emailed Richard and we started collaborating. And so we've been collaborators for the last few years now. But basically what we found was that there was this receptor called IR21A that was expressed very strongly in the Arista and was all over the sensory endings of these cells. And this is gonna be really cool. I, trust me, it's actually gonna be interesting, uh, I hope. Okay. So what these IRs are, are they're relatives of ionotropic glutamate receptors, like NMDA and AMPA receptors, but they don't respond to NMDA or glutamate or any of that stuff. They're a, they're a separate family only found in invertebrates. And while the glutamate receptors work in synaptic transmission, the IRs actually localize to sensory neurons and serve as sensory receptors. So you could think of them as rather than being postsynaptic to another neuron, they're kind of postsynaptic to the world, to the environment, right? So they, a lot of them respond to, to chemicals that look like glutamate, you know, acids and amines, and they're, but they normally work as olfactory receptors. So there are a ton of these in invertebrate organisms, you know, 60 of them in flies, you can find them in bed bugs, uh, you know, all sorts of insects have a large family of these. Now, Mostly what they do is they predominantly work as chemical receptors. And here's an example. So they often work as hetero oligomers, we believe, uh, and they respond to a variety of different chemicals. What we noticed about IR21A was that people had been studying this family for many years. And there were a whole bunch of receptors in this family or a small number that had never been chemically deorthanized. And what we realized was that the receptor we had that was expressed in the thermoreceptors had never been deorphanized, making us think that maybe it doesn't have a chemical ligand, right? And so like mutants in this gene and it happened. And this IR21A protein is out here and we think it isn't a chemical receptor. But we, so we started recording from the cooling cells again. What you're looking at here, this is actual data before I showed you a cartoon. This is actually what the data looks like. This is a wild type and we're recording the cooling cell and you can see at 30 degrees it's spiking. When we drop the temperature the spiking increases and then when we warm it up the spiking stops, right? So that's what I was talking about before about how these neurons behave. In an IR21A mutant nothing happens. You just get firing, right? It's all baseline firing. So that really told us that the IR21A molecule really important for cooling detection. And in fact, what we later found was that 21A has friends. Uh, it works with other members, O receptors that are expressed in many neurons that all together work to uh, detect cooling in the fly. Okay, so what we've got now is we've got a receptor for cooling. And then the question is, what does it do behaviorally in the animal? Does it drive cold avoidance? Does it drive warm avoidance? You know, what does it do? It turns out it drives both. It drives both cooling, it drives cold avoidance and warm avoidance, okay? So this is pretty neat, right? So we've got this one receptor, it's activated by, inhibited by warming, but behaviorally it's required 
for both of the responses. Without it, the flies just can't tell what's going on. And so that really tells us pretty clearly that our model was totally wrong, right? Not only are these not hot receptors and cold receptors, they're not like labeled lines that are pushing animals away from one temperature and another. So the question is, how does it work? And the honest truth is we don't know, but what do we think? So what we're now thinking about is that it takes two kinds of receptors to do thermosensing, or at least thermotaxis. There are receptors that respond to derivatives, to changes in temperature, and maybe there are other receptors that respond to absolute temperature. And so the idea is that when the cooling cell gets activated, cold place, the animal senses that as life is getting worse. But if the cooling cell is being activated and it's warm, that means life is getting better, right? Because what's gonna happen, right, is that the cooling cell is being activated as the fly is going toward its preferred temperature from a hot temperature. So in reality, what's going on, we think, is that the animal is interpreting the activation of this neuron in totally different ways, depending on whether it's cold or hot. And so we predict that there are going to be other, well, we predict, we hope, we think, that there are going to be other classes of thermoreceptors that respond to absolute temperature, not just derivative sensors. So we think that we have only half of the picture. And this is kind of cool because in work I won't really have a chance to talk about, uh, we've done a lot of collaboration with Greg Jeffress and worked on the connectome of the fly brain. And what that has told us is that these heat cells are only a small part of the picture. And in fact, we have discovered multiple classes of additional thermoreceptors in the fly. And we've also mapped out the connectome in the brain and what we see is that what's going on at the first synapses is that you've got postsynaptic neurons that are integrating input from multiple classes of thermoreceptors. And then it's even passed on further to that. So what we anticipate is really a couple of things. One thing is that there are many more classes of thermoreceptors to come. And the second thing would be that thinking about how this information is combined is really important for eventually understanding how the animal navigates and is going, I think is going to be pretty cool. And the reason, part of the reason I think it's going to be pretty cool is that this is essentially the same problem that human beings have, which is that the receptors in our skin, if you look at the classic, actually I have the book right here. There's this great book from Hensel, right? On human, uh, human thermoreceptors. I won't show you the pictures, but it's amazing. They used to do the recordings on themselves. So you see them underneath an EFIS rig, it's, it's terrible. But what you see is that most of our peripheral receptors are primarily responding to changes in temperature, not absolute temperature, right? And so effectively, all of our peripheral input, much of it at our skin is neutral. It's not good or bad, it's just information. And then what happens is, all of those skin thermoreceptors end up going into the hypothalamus, where you also have another class of thermoreceptors that's monitoring the temperature of your blood, right? And so the idea is, if you're cooling, right, should you shiver and, or, or, or should you vasoconstrict, right? And if you're warming, do you sweat and vasodilate? You don't really know. So in, in, in fact, the idea is that cooling is bad when you're too cold, but it's good when you're hot, right? And so the idea is you've got to compare what's going on out in the periphery with what's going on in, your, in terms of your blood body temperature. And that that sort of integration is happening in the hypothalamus and we anticipate that there's an equivalent thing going on in the insect. And so, you know, I think that the insect is going to be, it's complicated, but it's much less complicated than it is in the mammalian systems. And so we're really hoping that we'll be able to get at some of the integrating mechanisms that are used to set body temperature, looking in this animal that is not actually, you know, many people have thought that insects are useless because for studying body temperature control, because they're not homeotherms, but we suspect that a lot of the basic problems are, are gonna be faced by insects as well, okay? Oh, now, well, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna keep my camera off, but I, I this is Daniela. Hi. I just have a question. I know that um, your work, in the flies is really focused on behavior and 
and, it, and uh, the receptors you identified in the arista in the brain are really sensing the change, like you said, yeah. it's not the absolute temperature. But do you think that maybe in other contexts, maybe not in the brain or the antenna, do you think there's any chance that the same receptors could in a different context in partnered maybe with other proteins, other things like actually be involved in absolute temperature sensing for controlling completely different kinds of uh, processes. So you must be reading my grants. Um, what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> well, it's um, related to Anna's work and, and the grant that actually, I actually <laughs> we we have we have evidence that some of the same receptors are can be can function as absolute temperature receptors. And actually, I'm doing some stuff with Eve Martyr right now to look into how other aspects of the physiology of the neuron determine whether it is tonic or phasic, for example. And so that is absolutely the case, right? And so we anticipate that what we're really looking at is an emergent phenomenon. And in fact, what I should tell you, for example, with GR28, the heat receptor, if we put it into an oocyte, it is absolutely constant. It, it, the current that comes through it is it acts like a thermometer. You can tell what the temperature is by how much current is going through it, right? But if you put that, if you look at it in the context of the heating cell, it is not like that at all, where it's rapidly adapting and it primarily responds to derivatives. So you're totally right. And yes, the answer is yes. Okay, that makes me feel better because Anna, I mean, I don't know how much she's told you about her work, but she is working on the response of the ovary to temperature. Yeah. And part of what I propose in my grant is to test whether your temperature receptors could be involved in that. <laughs> and it would not be surprising at all. So again, I suspect that all of this tonic, phasic, derivative, absolute value stuff is primarily set by other conductances in those cells. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah, the question I had was kind of complementary of Daniela's. I, I wanted to know if you have a guess of how other organs in flies can perceive external temperature because Flies, they don't have an internal, they, they are not able to control their internal body temperature as mammals, right? We keep a constant temperature. Flies, they respond to external temperatures. So how the other organs, how do you have a guess, how, how they behave, behavior in front of these different external temperatures yeah. if they can't do that? In yeah, I mean, that's, it's a great question and I, and I think we just don't know. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, so primarily, most of them don't have a very rapid response to it. And so um, the question is, it's, you know, there's different mechanisms, it could be cell autonomous, it could also be that many of these thermoreceptors are primarily working by controlling release of factors that in turn influence the behavior of other things. We honestly don't know. And it's a great question. The temperature is a, um, it's complicated and how they manage to survive you know, between 18 and 32 without teeling out, no one knows. So it's a great question. I don't know. I guess we're all going to be in business for a while. I'd like to make a Go question ahead. also, if, if you don't mind, since we've interrupted hey, already. I met you at, didn't I meet you at, um, I think I met you in Crete, right? Yes. <laughs> all right. Yeah. How's it going? <laughs> Good. Yeah. So, um, so you're proposing that the external receptors they're um, firing on to the more internal receptors, right? So you have a connectome that will, will um, bind these arista sensing receptors that sense difference in temperature and the internal ones are the ones that would be sensing temperature. That's what you propose. Okay, so it, if it, that's, yeah, I, I'm right till there, okay. What I was gonna tell you actually, and then you can ask the rest of it. We, I didn't go into it, but there are projection neurons in the antenna lobe. And what's really cool is that individual projection neurons, we can see sending processes to like the hot cell and the internal cells where we can see actually in the anatomy that they're clearly integrating that information at the first synapses. Okay. So go on. But then you'll have some internal neuron, whichever it is, that will be, you're proposing sensing a certain temperature, right? So my question is, uh, if you get different species, 
that live in temp different temperatures all the time. So you would expect maybe that the Arista ones, they are kind of more similar or less variable between these different clients, while the more internal ones that sense the temperatures, they would vary more. Would that be a good, uh, good assumption? So actually, great question. So we've actually done a lot of work on Drosophila mohavensis, which is a cactophilic uh, Drosophila, mm -hmm. and it looks like the opposite. In fact, oh. what's really interesting is that their preferred temperature is incredibly similar to the Drosophila melanogaster preferred temperature. What they differ in is their ability to withstand extremes. But if you give them the choice, almost the identical temperature that Drosophila melanogaster go to, which is, but in their, if we do, if we look at the Aristi, their arista are less sensitive to temperature fluctuation than Drosophila melanogaster. <laughs> so it's, cool. it's, it's fascinating, right? So we've actually, we've never, we haven't published this yet, but we've done temperature swaps where we've taken receptor swaps, where we've taken fly receptors, melanogaster, uh -huh. and stuck them into mohavensis. But the problem is, is that it turns out that the level of expression is very important. Mm. So I can get you whatever result you want to make a cool story just by changing the level of expression. I and see. so it's very difficult to do these kinds of things, but to, to do the real swaps. But it's a great question, but it's the reverse, which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. It's like everything. That's why I like working on temperature for two reasons. Uh, One is hmm. everything I think I know is always wrong. And the other thing is that it seems like almost any kind of molecule can be turned into a thermoreceptor, right? Chemoreceptors, other things. So you don't know what you're gonna get. So it's actually one of the places where you can actually make discoveries. And in fact, I should mention that we know about seven classes of molecules that are pretty good thermoreceptors. Five of them have been discovered in the last seven years. So I anticipate that the number of biological thermoreceptors is gonna keep going up. So there's a lot more to discover. So it's pretty fun. Yeah. All right. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Drosophila. And then Pedro, I'll let there's you... a question, Pedro. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, ju just because uh, 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 I thought you, you were going to change gears. So, and uh, the, the, the question is okay, I can understand uh, a receptor, the, uh, uh, a channel that changes with temperature. But how it gets used? Do you have any? guess about the molecular mechanism that would be involved involved in the receptor getting silent after a while we have no idea about any of this the molecular basis of how these thermoreceptors respond to temperature there is no data on this if you look if you read like crystal structure there's a lot of cryo ems of trip channels and what you will always see if you look at those papers in detail they will have a lot of information about chemical agonists. And then they'll say, oh, and these are also activated by temperature. But nobody has any idea how temperature works on the, to activate the channel or to inhibit the channel. So that's, those are great open questions. And I think you know, there's some interesting things. One thing that's really interesting from a thermodynamic perspective is that many of these receptors have lipids in the pore. And the idea would be that's a great way to get a really huge change in heat capacity is to reveal hydrophobic residues. So it could be that lipid protein interactions are really important. So it's not just the protein, but it's the protein interacting with other lipids that's going to be really important. That's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and then a nice idea would be that the changing the lipid fluidity by inserting double bonds on things like that might connect with metabolism because Absolutely. those are, are NADPH dependent reactions. Totally. And it also will change the thickness of the membrane as well. And that can also influence the channel. So yeah, it, these are great ideas. Uh, they're hard to test in, a, in the fly sometime, but it's definitely totally cool. So I'm gonna have like two more parts. Uh, one part is gonna be structural, which I hope people will find interesting. Uh, and then the last part will be about mosquitoes. How about that? All right. So 
I should mention that these are actually cooling receptors because if we take a, a, a fly and we look at their gustatory neurons, we can cool down certain bristles and we don't see any response because these are chemical sensors, not thermoreceptors, right? But if we express our receptors in them, we can get them to fire. So we can ectopically express these receptors and get them to work. The problem with these ionotropic receptors is that we can't do those oocyte experiments. I mean, we can do them. We spent years doing them, but they never work. Okay, so we thought something else is going on. So what's really interesting is that these neurons are the craziest looking neurons I've ever seen. So their sensory endings are incredibly, they're what are referred to as lamellated. They look like onions. And so what you're looking at here is a section through this, and it's been known for decades. And what's really cool is that different insects have thermoreceptors that have more and more elaborate endings. And the more elaborate the ending, the more sensitive the neuron, okay? Drosophila is the same way. So almost, what was this, like 30 years ago, uh, Steinbrecht showed that the cooling cell, that cell I was recording from that we were talking about, if you look at it in an EM, it's a huge monster. This is its dendrite. This little red thing here is the hot cell, which is like sitting in the corner. This thing is incredibly complicated. The dark blue area is, a, is equivalent to the extracellular region, and these are microtubules. And what I want you to look at carefully here is you'll see that there are little membrane membrane tethers between the extracellular membrane that are called boss elements. And they serve to kind of, we don't know exactly what they do, but they seem to weld together the plasma membranes of these neurons. What's really interesting is that when we do the EM, we see the same thing. But when we do it in our thermoreceptor mutants, all of those, all of that elaborate morphology goes away. And you end up with a cylinder filled with microtubules. Also, all the tethers go away. So what's especially cool is if we express the IR21A receptor in the red cell. So this cell, normally the blue cell makes IR21A and the red cell doesn't, okay? If we express IR21A in the red cell, what happens is that the blue cell swallows it. Essentially, it surrounds the hot cell and it forms the same junctions that it normally forms with itself with the hot cell. So I'm just gonna show you a high mag version of this. Normally when the hot cell and the cold cell touch each other, it's like two lips coming together. But when the cold cell membrane tries to touch itself, it can't. It forms these junctions that are about 20 nanometers that link together the membrane. What's really cool is if we just add IR21A to this red cell, we see those junctions form between the hot cell and the cold cell, okay? So this I think is kind of cool. What it means is that these receptors are not just necessary, but in some ways sufficient to create these junctions between adjacent membranes. I should also mention that this cool that this heating cell gets turned into a cooling cell when we put IR twenty one A in it. Okay. Cool question: Is that a developmental phenotype, or can you change that after the fly develops? Like, it, is it a is also a maintenance phenotype, or just yeah, it's a maintenance phenotype. So if we get rid of it later, they degenerate. Not, I mean, if we get rid of it in the middle, they don't. They, they seem to degenerate. Yeah. So like we were saying, you know, the, the hot cell and the cold cell normally live next to each other and form these elements. And then the IR mutants, they don't, right? This neuron stops returning. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. What is here? I, I went out of the insect some time ago, but I'm now very much interested in metabolism and, but also uh, in protein structure. So yeah. these junctions, they, they are the, the protein itself, uh, it's part of the jungle, the, the junctions, or this is the matrix that gets organized some protein in the tissue. So honestly, we have no idea the protein content here. What I can tell you is that there's almost no other material up here but these junctions and that IR21A is all over this area. So it would be very unlikely that IR21A was not in here because it's about tall enough 
but we have no idea. So what we're doing, I have a, a graduate student that's been doing single cell sequencing because we anticipate that there, there look to be from the EMs thousands of these structures on the cooling cell. So we assume that it's an abundant set of proteins. So we're trying to identify all the, the sort of membrane, transmembrane proteins that are there, but we honestly do not know what it is made of. That's a great question. So we honestly don't know. Could it be a, a ligand for, for the receptor? Yeah, we actually suspect that it's a heteromeric complex because mm -hmm. this is BS, okay? This is baloney, but this is what we think. The idea <laughs> is um, if you look at the way they're next to each other, when we put IR21A in this middle cell, it forms junctions with the blue cell, but it doesn't form junctions with itself. Whereas the cold cell forms junctions with itself. So we wonder whether these might be heteromeric, but we honestly do not know. I never, I never went exactly deep in that, but this image looks a lot like myelin formation in axons. So is there a myelin formation in the structure like these junk junctions? So these are a bit different than the myelins in, the, in that they have these, it's like this 3D make with the 20 nanometer junction is very specific with these elements between it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no, so, you know, it'd be fantastic if it were something like that, uh, but we really don't have any evidence that it looks like that. I've been trying to find, the only other thing I can find that looks like this is the insect CO2 receptors. I also have these junctions, which is interesting. But yeah, we don't know, it's a great question. I don't know what it does either, you know? Like it, it's correlated with choline detection, but we don't mm -hmm. know if mechanistically it's required, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, sorry for... <laughs> No, don't be sorry. That's great. It's a good question. I honestly just don't know. Like, this is great because, you know, I don't know anything. And so it's good. Um, so, okay. So that means organizational role for the IRs. So what we're thinking then is that they specify the morphogenesis as well as the cooling. That suggests that maybe they're more than just an eye. They're acting as more than just like a trip channel, which is basically just a hole in the membrane that opens up. And what we want to know, as, as Clarissa raised the question, how is their organizational role raised related to the transduction role? We're just ignorant and we're trying to you know, figure it out. So a couple of things I want to do before talking about the mosquitoes in the last part is just some take homes. That often when people think of temperature sensing, they think of hot and cold. But in reality, there's also heating receptors and cooling receptors, and they function very differently than cold receptors or hot receptors. They provide different information. They're used for different purposes. And your body has both classes. They may rely on related molecules, but functionally, they're actually quite different. The other thing is we often think of trips and thermosensation as being synonymous, and that's not true. We know of, of many different classes of molecules now, that can serve as thermoreceptors. And in fact, I, I suspect that almost any sensory receptor, almost any receptor could potentially be modified in such a way that its activity was temperature dependent. And so I anticipate that there are going to be many more unexpected thermoreceptors to arise. So trip channels were not a big surprise. They were first discovered in mammals. But you know, when we found this gustatory receptor, that was really a surprise. And when we found the IRs, that was also a surprise, right? Um, and other people have discovered other classes that, that are really important. Um, the other thing is it's probably more than just isolated channel activity that's causing these things to be thermoreceptors, or at least how they're contributing to thermosensitivity. Like I said, the GR28 receptor is really just a dumb heat receptor in oocytes. But in the neuron, we see a much more complicated pattern of activity. And with the IRs, I showed you that they seem to be required to organize this really crazy structure. So that suggests to us that they're more than just simple holes in the membrane that let ions in, although they may do that as well. Okay, so um, in the last few minutes, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what's going on in vector insects in my lab. This will be the short part of the talk because we've only been doing it for about five years and it's been slow going, so we only really have one story. So hopefully that'll make it easy to remember. Um, as you probably know, um, there are lots of dangerous insects out there. And I know a lot of people in Brazil look at assassin bugs, which are responsible for many thousands of deaths every year. Um, 
mosquitoes at the current rate are amongst the most deadliest of the animals in the world. They kill at least half a million people or more every year. Um, they spread a variety of nasty diseases. And I'm sure as you all know, the global burden of vector-borne disease is very high. And so what we've been interested in trying to do is to think about how mosquitoes might use, might, might blood feed, because of course, this is how they transmit the disease, right? And the mosquito I'm gonna be telling you about today is Anopheles gambiae. It's one of the primary vectors of malaria in Africa. I think it was briefly released in South America, but was then uh, eradicated in one of the few, I think, really successful examples of eradicating this mosquito. Okay. And the key thing about mosquitoes, the females have to blood feed to produce offspring. And as a side effect, uh, pathogens have hitchhiked this process and um, given us all kinds of nasty diseases. So how mosquitoes find you is that basically they can sense the carbon dioxide that you're letting off. That gets the females excited. They then can see you and smell you. That gets them close to you. But when they really wanna go in and find your blood vessels, they use heat and moisture. And so what my lab has been working on for about five years now is trying to understand how heat and moisture contribute to um, blood feeding in the mosquito. And um, this work all is based on some really beautiful work that was done in 1910. Uh, by Howlett. And what he did was he had noticed he was a, a colonial British person. And he, he noticed that mosquitoes were troublesome at tea time and that they were fond of hovering near the teapot, being apparently attracted by the heat. And he went on to have his manservant perform many experiments for him that helped demonstrate that mosquitoes were indeed attracted to heat. And this is a, a figure from his paper where they put mosquitoes in a mesh bag and saw that they would try to bite a hot tube. All right, so what drives heat seeking? So this has been something that people have wondered about for a long time. And people have traditionally thought, oh, heat seeking must involve a heat receptor. And so uh, a number of laboratories uh, have knocked out the receptors that we discovered in Drosophila for heat in mosquitoes. But the problem is you can knock those out and they don't have anything to do with heat seeking in the mosquito, at least as far as we can tell. They actually are involved in avoidance of very high temperature, which is actually what trip A1 is involved in in the fly as well. So what we wondered is whether maybe thinking about it as activating a warming receptor was thinking about it backwards. Maybe what was going on is that maybe the mosquitoes were finding you by actually relying on a cooling receptor and having it being inhibited. That could work just as well. So of course we started thinking about IR21A. And so we decided in collaboration, uh, we got a lot of help at the start with from Flaminia Cateruccia. As I note, this is not her hand, um, but basically we collaborated with Flaminia and to begin to knock out IR21A in mosquitoes and ask what it does. So basically what we did, we made some knockout mosquitoes, which you can now do uh, in Anopheles gambiae. I won't go through the details, but we made traditional knock-ins to get rid of the gene. And then we asked, what's the function? And the first way to get at the function is to ask where it's expressed. And what we saw was that it was expressed at the tip of the female antenna. And it was gone in the mutant. But what's really cool is that these, this tip of the female mosquito antenna is where the heat and cooling receptors are located, implicated in heat seeking behavior. So we next asked whether it asked, acted the same way in mosquitoes as in flies. And what we found is that mosquitoes have cooling receptors that get excited by cooling, they get inhibited by heating. But then when we knocked out IR21A, same result as in Drosophila. The cooling receptors go silent. Well, they don't go silent, but they stop responding to cooling, okay? So what that told us was that they were functioning similarly. And in fact, we can take the mosquito gene, put it into flies, and it works pretty well, okay? So, the molecular function is conserved. What about behaviorally? So what we did was we started looking at mosquito heat seeking behavior. And what that involves is you put mosquitoes in a box, you puff in some CO2 to, you know, to mimic breath, and then you give them the choice between two different temperatures of surface, 26 to 37. 
and the mosquitoes like 37. So here's the fun movie. I've sped it up fourfold. I hope this doesn't give anyone nightmares, but basically there's CO2 and you can see the mosquitoes start swarming. And then you'll eventually see them land on the hot pad and they like it. And they're actually trying to bite it. If you had a really good camera, you can see they're trying to bite it. Now in the IR21A, we give them some, a puff of carbon dioxide and you'll see them starting to swarm. But what goes on is that they just kind of swarm and they land on stuff, but they don't really find the hot pad very well. And so they're very defective in their ability to heat seek. It's not perfect, but it's pretty strong. So what that tells us, and this is the quantification, is that really goes way down their ability to find the hot target, okay? So the question is whether this just totally screws them up in all, all ways. So what we decided to do was to do a, an experiment where we would give them just a human hand, which has lots of different cues. It has odor, it has visual cues because it can see your hand. And so we started breathing on the side of it. And what we found was that the IR21A mosquitoes are a little slow getting there, but they're perfectly fine at finding your hand. So they can use all these other cues so they can still fly around, they can still find you, they just can't use the heat signature to do it anymore, okay? And so um, basically what this tells us is that their molecular function is conserved, but behaviorally they almost have the opposite role, which is that you've got mosquitoes that are using it for warm seeking, but the Drosophila are actually using it to avoid warm temperature. So presumably it's something in the circuitry up in the brain that really matters. Okay, so the real, other question is, what does it do to blood feeding? And so what we did was we kind of reduced a human being down to a pool of blood. So what we've got are, are two blood, two basically piece, two uh, containers filled with blood, one of which is heated up. We dye one green and one red. And then we ask, you know, what color did they digest? And you might see that that looks a little hard to see. So what we do is we actually take them out and squish them on filter paper and see what color splotch they leave. Okay, so this is guys that drank red blood, green blood, or no blood. Okay, so we're just squishing them. Everything in my lab is really high tech. Okay, so what so, we see uh, the, is that- The amount of food it changed? Um, so we did not score that. Um, so I can't honestly tell you that. Um, what we notice is that the splotches tend to be bigger if it's warm. So they might have additional internal perceptions. And in in this in this experiment, so yeah. uh, how much time? Oh, it's twenty minutes. Yeah, twenty minutes. So on, only twenty minutes. Only twenty minutes. Yeah. Okay. So we basically just put these containers on the top. We don't give them any extra CO two or anything. We just give them twenty minutes, and they they can locate it and they find it pretty well. Um. So what we see is that the fraction of mosquitoes normally that drink the warm meal is higher than the room temperature meal. But when we knock out IR21A, it's identical basically between the two genotypes, okay? Similar amounts drink the both blood. So that means they can still drink blood and they can still see it, but they are not attracted to the heat anymore. And so they don't feed as much. All right. so. This is just the first step, right? Like this is our, uh, I didn't put it in here. We published this paper earlier this year. So you can find it. Um, uh, it's Greppy et al, Science 2020. So we published it earlier this year, but basically what we're trying to do now is to try to understand more about how this works. But what we do know is that when we knock out our, that really what's driving this heat seeking response appears to be the IR21A cooling receptor, which is kind of the opposite of the way we thought it was gonna work. And what's cool about this is that if you think about the evolution of IR21A, it's kind of fascinating, I think, because IR21A is at least a half a billion years old and that's well before land colonization. So that's when you were looking at the aquatic ancestors of all of these insects, okay? And the other co-receptors that it's sensing temperature with, they're all back here. So these were all present well before any of the ancestors of these animals went on to land. 
So we have no idea what it was used for back then. The last common ancestor of the fly and the mosquito is back here during the Triassic. And actually blood feeding didn't evolve until apparently the late Triassic or early Jurassic after these diverged, okay? And so what's really sort of interesting about this is that what it really means is that IR-21A was probably being used as a cooling receptor or a cold receptor before blood feeding evolved. And what that probably means is that it co-opted this pre-existing cooling receptor to use for heat seeking to help them drink blood. So rather than coming up with new receptors to host seek, basically it did what kind of makes sense evolutionarily, which is it just co-opted molecules that had lying around and made them use them to do a new job. So I think that's pretty fun. The other thing worth noting is that blood feeding evolved at least 12 different times amongst insects. So all of these have independent origins. And so what we really don't know is how generalizable is what we've discovered in mosquitoes to other kinds of blood feeding animals. We have no idea. Is it parallel evolution or do they use different pathways? Okay, all I think really interesting questions. All right, so anyway, that's all I was gonna talk about today. Uh, I think I already said all this stuff. You don't need to know that. A uh, lot further to go. We know a little bit about heat. We know a little bit about CO2, but we have no idea how this is all put together. And so again, thermosensation is not just trips, right? Thermosensation is also not just hot and cold, it's heating and cooling. And the other thing is that thermosensing in some ways is kind of a matter of perspective. And what you might think about is heat seeking is also the same thing as fleeing the cold. So with all of that, I'm gonna thank my lab. Uh, I'm in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm currently actually right here in Newton, Massachusetts. You can see my window. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Chloe and Willem and Gonzalo and Elaine. Working with mosquitoes is very difficult and they've really done an amazing job. Uh, and uh, I also wanna thank these individuals that used to be in my lab. They, many of them now have their own labs. Uh, and are working on interesting questions. And I'm happy to take any questions in the time that you guys want to do it. Okay. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. No. Great. Thank you, Paul. I think people liked it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, I think uh, there is no question in the chat box. So I think if someone wants to make a question, I you have just a question. can unmute. Luciana. Yeah, oh, I have a question. Sure. Hi, I'm Luciana. That was a re really great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering if you if you know or if you have tested whether these heat receptors, whether they have any role in olfaction or uh, any interaction with uh, olfaction receptors since they are located really, really close to olfaction receptors? So, two things I will say. One thing is that in the connectome, in the antennal lobe, we actually see that a subset of olfactory receptors, there are projection neurons that get combined input. So there are some projection neurons that get, for example, there are some in the Drosophila brain that get input from both the CO2 receptor and the heat receptor, and others that get receptor, you know, other kinds of chemicals. So wiring wise, it looks like that's really true. We also see that in the larvae. And what we often wonder is whether maybe some of this stuff, the other thing that's cool is that some of the thermoreceptors in the larvae, and actually in the fly adult as well, are hooked to inhibitory interneurons that project to olfactory glomeruli. So what we really wonder is whether some of these thermoreceptors are used to contain, control the gain mm -hmm. because olfactory receptors are probably gonna be more active when it's hot, right? Because they're both sped up and there's more, more odor. So we wonder whether yeah. the heating receptors are changing the gain through this lateral inhibition. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'll finally say is that we know that both the IRs and GR28 are derived from chemical receptors. So we think evolutionarily, that might be why this is in the, old, the antennal lobe, is we suspect mm -hmm. that these are probably derived from neurons that used to be olfactory neurons 
and they turned wow. into thermos. That's cool. Yeah, it's pretty fun, right? That's it's beautiful. all you bet. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah. It's a great question. Hi, Paul. This is Marcelo Lorenzo. Uh, thanks oh, for hi. the great talk. Uh, I have loads of questions, but uh, I would start with a, uh, a single one that, that relates to what uh, you showed about mosquitoes feeding on, on uh, less blood if they, if they have the, the knockout of the IR-21A. Um, yeah. You mentioned that they, they tend to eat less. But have you tested whether if you force them over this, the blood source, instead of uh, letting them look for it, if they feed more or less than the wild types? Because it could, it could also be that they could feed the same, but they find it much less. Uh, I mean, it's uh, just about uh, search or, or feeding acceptance. So, so what I will tell you is that um, during the shutdown here in the United States, uh, Willem, a postdoc in my lab, has built the Vitascope, which is this really cool thing where you have a, a camera trained on an artificial membrane. Mm -hmm. And so that's the experiment that we're trying to do right now, is exactly what you're saying, is what, looking at the details of the feeding. Does it control bout length? Does it control belly distension? We don't know yeah. that. And it's a great question. Because we know from triatomins from really long ago that they can feed on blood kept at four centigrades. So basically they can take anything, any temperature, but they take much longer. So they do it slowly, but they do, they, they, they do feed at the same uh, final volume. So that's why I'm, I'm wondering whether it is acceptance or, or really ability to find it, to recognize it. Great question, and hopefully we'll be able to address that by doing this kind of, what's really cool is that Felix Hole has done this thing where you can basically yeah. measure the distension rate and all that stuff. Yeah. And so we've been setting that up. So we have the camera working, but you know, Wonderful. the problem is that my lab is working in shifts. And so, mm -hmm. and you know, it's hard to get it done yeah. fast. Yeah. So uh, may I make a, a question related to that? So I think that uh, a few weeks ago, I, I was uh, examining a PhD thesis of Stephanie that I think is on the audience. Uh, and she presented her thesis, uh, making a time course transcriptome of head and body of mosquitoes after emergence from the pupil. And what she was looking for was genes that were uh, involved in acquiring the capacity to feed on blood. Because during the first days, an adult female doesn't feed, simply doesn't accept. Then uh, between two to four days, it starts to, to, to acknowledge that the blood, uh, blood is there. So uh, Stephanie, uh, if you are still there, <laughs> do you know, do you uh, uh, remember if some of the genes of that Paul was studying were there? But it was a hair. Hi, <laughs> Hi Stephanie. Uh, great talk, Paul. So I was just tracking down a paper here because in my transcriptome, I could not see genes that were in the antenna as you as Paul said, the genes in the tip of the antenna, right? So I cannot see these genes because the amount of the antenna in my samples were very low. So I cannot see the expression of those genes. So I, I was tracking down a paper here uh, that this is a transcriptome of antenna uh, in the first days after emergence. And I was looking at the expression of I, <laughs> IR1, IR21. Like a real time but, experiment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> IR21A, it's here. Uh, but it's not very expressed. It's the 25% lowest expression. So I don't know. 
Okay, so but that that's an interesting thing to to look if some of those guys would be involved in acquiring the capacity to to feed them blood. Totally. Absolutely. They 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 just submitted the paper. So send ah. the paper to him. Yeah, that would be great. I okay. appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, but, Which but, mosquito uh, species? Oh. Uh, yeah. the, the expression of these temperature receptors are very, very ro ro uh, low, right, Paul? Um, they're very high in the cells that express them. Okay. Actually, but, higher 21A But is that are very high. little, but there are only six yeah. cells, right? Exactly. Yeah. Making biochemistry <laughs> difficult. Okay. So maybe, maybe that's why the expression was so, so low. I think you're totally right. You know, if you put these things into cells, it makes them go crazy with temperature. So you probably want to do it sparingly. What what species of mosquito are you looking at? Aedes aegypti. Ah, okay, cool. So we're we're just starting to look at it in Aedes aegypti right now. So the lab, because we're really curious to know whether it's the same in Aedes as in Anopheles or not because yeah. there's no one's really tested this notion that there's a common evolutionary origin to blood feeding in mosquitoes, right? We think there is, but we honestly don't know how different the strategies are going to be in different mosquito species. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Can I, can okay. I have a... I don't know uh, if you have anyone has another I, more questions or- I have uh, one. Anna? I have one. Okay. Clarissa, you and then okay. Fernando. Okay, so back to the the very interesting uh, structure of the the receptor and the relations with the receptor, and I'm always trying to 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 get uh, the comparison with the mammalian system. So. Uh, would it be so these receptors are similar to the NMDA receptors? So is it possible or have it been tested that the NMDA can change structure with uh, temperature? No, although there is some evidence that a subset of K8 receptors, are thermosensitive. They're not very closely related to the IRs, but there is evidence that two K8 receptors can be acting as cooling activated receptors in, in, mm -hmm. in mice. So I think there might be some evidence for that. I mean, there is evidence for that. And also I was wondering uh, this uh, structure of, of myelin and yeah. I found a structure that can, it's very likely to, to be similar uh, thing that is the schmidt lanterman in seizures in the myelin, hmm. their connections, uh, it, it, it looks very much like that. Could it, you send it, me the paper? I would love to see that, that would be great. I can share my screen. Yeah. <laughs> I just here. Oh, I shared the wrong screen. It's cool. This one. Yeah. Share. So can you see it? This? Yeah. How Which long is that? What's what's the scale bar on that? Mm. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, this is EM uh, and this is yeah. the axon. Yeah. So, and this is the membrane. Uh huh. Oh, I see. That's really cool. Oh, can so you send? Okay. The functions between the myelin and the axon. Oh, that's really neat. If you blow that up, do you see like the little striations between the membranes? I can't really see it. I'll have to look at that later. That's cool. Yeah. And it would be great if there was a conserved structure in mammals. Yeah. 
yeah, then maybe the different uh, proteins, but they have even some already some proteins described. Okay, it's uh, for a long time, so they know the structure. So they have yeah. some proteins that you can compare. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Actually, what's ironic is we actually did a, 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 a um, targeted genetic screen where we knocked down a lot of these proteins and and so far, at least, we haven't found anything that 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 is that is. Uh, we looked at some of the Drosophila homologs of like spectrin mm -hmm. and Lin7 and stuff, and we, we didn't have any defect in the cooling cell when we knocked it down. But that's cool. I'd be curious yeah, so to see what it looks they, like. They have this cat CADM4. Huh. I'll have to take a look at that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. You should. Uh, I'll have to find the paper. I should take a screenshot. Yeah, you can. I, I stopped that. Uh, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Fernando, I think you can ask the question. Th thanks for the marvelous talk. Uh, I'm curious if uh, about is there anything done with the larval stage? Are these receptors active in larvae, mosquito uh, or drosophila? So, um, yeah, there's a whole or, or does larva larva ha have this behavior? Larvae are amazing. So actually, I didn't talk about any of it, but actually, a chunk of my lab has been working on the larvae for about ten years. So I do a lot of it with a physicist, Arvi Samuel, and for behavior, it's amazing because you can we can watch all the turning and stuff. So they what it's it's cool. So we actually just have a paper that it's up on BioArchive right now is our latest one where we have the opponent cells where the IR21A is absolutely required in the larvae for the cooling cell, but it turns out that there's a heating cell, but it actually uses a receptor that in the adult is used to sense moist. But I have no idea, but IR68A is the, is the heating receptor. And the two of them work just like the heating cell and the cooling cell in the adult. And it's really nice because we can actually look at how the animal responds to these fluctuations at various temperatures. And it looks like what's going on in the larvae is that um, both of those are always driving turning. Whenever you activate them, you drive the turning and you simply turn up or turn down the gain on how much it listens to the two different cells depending on the absolute temperature. And so that's, that's a great question. The larvae are fantastic to work at because we have a complete connectome and there's only about what is it? There's five cooling sensing cells and four heating sensing cells. And so it's much more, it's much simpler anatomically, but you're totally right. And you can do all kinds of stuff you can't do in the adult. Um, but yeah, so that, that it's a totally valuable system to do that. I don't know about the mosquito larva. We haven't looked at that. But the temperature preferences are different, right? Larva don't like 25, actually. They prefer 18, right? No, actually it turns out that that's complicated. Oh. So it turns out that um, what happens is, is that early in their life, the stages, the first two stages, larval stages, they like 25 degrees. And then what happens is, as they transition to third instar, what happens is they actually turn down expression of IR21A, and that causes them to shift to colder temperatures. And so a lot of the work that's done in L3 is really complicated to interpret. Because a lot of the Montel work with rhodopsins and stuff, you get the same phenotype with a developmental delay. So it's very unclear to us what's going on in any of that literature. But what's really clear is that it's IR21A and GR68 and IR68A, and you turn down expression of the cooling pathway as the larvae reaches third instar. Why you do that, I don't know, but that's what happens. Thank you. You bet. Thank you for the question. It's it's great. I'd love to talk about the larvae, but I, I felt like I was already going over. So I apologize. So uh, Logu, Logu uh, is there any oh is there any more questions or do we I do have one. Uh, okay. Maybe uh, okay, Marcel. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, yes. you mentioned that uh, Drosophila and uh, Anophilus, they they react exactly the opposite. To the same, uh, yeah, kind of avoid yeah, yeah. attraction. Yes. 
Right. Uh, have you tested the uh, mosquitoes, the fed mosquitoes, to see whether you, it's a matter of balance? Or so if, if they, once they are fed, they can use the same information to avoid the host? Like triatomines, for example, do that with CO2. They turn it uh, uh, the opposite. So they use it to avoid the host. Uh, could it be it, uh, that mosquitoes can use uh, the, the same receptor as Drosophila does, but in a different uh, physiological state? That's a great question. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't thought of it, so we hadn't done it, but that's a good suggestion. So thank you. <laughs> I don't know. We honestly don't uh, know. Okay. Okay, so I think we're good. We're done. <laughs> right, well, thanks, everybody. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. Good seeing you. Thank you, Paul, oh, for, the, for the very good thank presentation. You. Thank, yeah. you. thank you. Thank Take you, everybody. Bye, Paul. Invitation, Anna. Bye. Thank Bye. you for accepting it. Thank you very much. For <laughs> yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.